Wow. Uh, I'm incredibly humbled and honored to be here. It's just such a fun event, and I'm really excited to be here. Um, I won't be talking about mastering Ethereum, um, except for one thing. There are probably at least a dozen people in this room who contributed to make that book happen. I don't know if you know the story, but if you don't, I work with my publisher to make the books that I publish through O'Reilly open source, which is something they don't do with all of their books. And not just open source eventually, but open source from the beginning. So you can download my books on GitHub and read them for free. Um, and of course you can also buy them. But most importantly, I had the freedom and the privilege to be able to write my book as a collaborative project in the true spirit of open source. I'm a very big believer in the creative commons. In fact, I think that's one of the things that we have that none of the competition has. And by we I mean the entire open source community around cryptocurrencies. We don't suffer from the tragedy of the commons of closed proprietary systems. We celebrate the festival of the commons through collaboration, the creative commons. And when I do my work, I know I'm standing on the shoulders of thousands of other people who have put their passion and their creativity into building things that I have the privilege of trying to explain in my books. And that's a collaborative process. Um, so Mastering Ethereum had 180 contributors who pushed more than 8,000 commits and submitted more than 1,000 pull requests and issues. More than a dozen of those people are in this room today. So thank you so much, all of you. You know who you are. Thank you. Now I've been provided with a, what I've been told is a crowler. It was suggested that I have a sip to loosen up before I do my presentation. That would send me directly into a blackout. <laughs> and why, I, by this point, I can probably do a full-blown Bitcoin presentation blind drunk. <laughs> but I think for an Ethereum presentation, I need to be sober. So. This will have to wait until the Q&A. So the way the Q&A goes is I start drinking when we start, and then it gets better <laughs> as it progresses. You'll know I have reached peak relaxation when I suggest that you should buy XRP. <laughs> that, at that point, I'm clearly drunk. Right? So I'm glad you're all here, and I'm glad you're all having fun. This is really a tremendous conference, which really showcases the culture and ethos of the Ethereum community and the broader cryptocurrency ecosystem. And I'm I'm really really honored to be here. The topic I want to talk about is a bit touchy, though. So I want to talk about unstoppable code. I bring a certain perspective because. I started with Bitcoin, and in fact, I've been fascinated by the cypherpunk ethos since the early 90s. Yeah, I'm that old. And part of that ethos is this idea of using cryptography as a defensive mechanism in order to claim, assert, and enforce our human rights. It's about using the magic of numbers that cannot be used offensively. They can only be used purely defensively. But they bring to an individual the awesome power that rivals even the power of the state. The most fearsome conglomerate of totalitarian governments in the world can kiss my 256-bit key, and they won't be able to brute force it. It doesn't matter how angry or violent or annoyed they are with what I said, or signed, or paid, or did. Cryptography gives individuals this ability to assert power, 
to assert sovereignty, to create the conditions that allow them to express human rights, and enforce human rights, and assert human rights. And I strongly believe in these things. I believe in freedom of expression, and freedom of speech, and creating diverse environments where we all have powers that can't be taken away from us. And so, one of the things that fascinated me about Ethereum from the very beginning was this idea of unstoppable code. You may have heard the slogan, unstoppable code. It was the first two words on the website during the launch. And I think it informs a lot of the people who got involved in this project early on. It is the same thing that makes me interested in Bitcoin, and that got me started on this journey. The idea of having speech that is uncensorable, not because you ask nicely, not because anybody likes what you have to say, but because they simply can't stop you. And that's a very powerful thing. And it's more necessary than ever in today's world. We're gradually sliding into crisis after crisis. We're seeing a rise of totalitarianism, and as a result, it's never been more important to give people all over the world the tools to be able to express themselves, to assert their rights, and to be sovereign. Right now, most of the environment in Ethereum is very, very kumbaya. I love it. Unicorns, buffy corns, puppies and rainbows. I love it. This beautiful wellspring of creativity, passion, joy, this sense of possibility. It's not going to last. And part of the reason it's not going to last is because what we're doing here is important. And it seizes power. It seizes power on behalf of individuals, but it seizes power from forms of power. Governments, corporations, states, associations, cultures, religions, countries. It seizes power from these big things and gives them to little people. And sooner or later, some of the people who are losing power in this equation, unearned power, undeserved power, abusively applied power, will start fighting back. And at that point, we're going to find out how unstoppable the code is. So what kind of code needs to be unstoppable? What kind of code do we need to build that is, in fact, unstoppable? Just like in free speech, the only speech worth protecting is that which offends, deeply offends. Innocuous speech does not require protection. In some cases, it doesn't even deserve it. Journalism is speaking the things people don't want you to publish. Everything else is public relations. You've heard that quote? The only speech worth protecting is the speech people don't want to hear. And the only code that needs to be unstoppable is code that someone's trying to stop. And that's worthwhile. That's exciting. Governance is the killer app for Ethereum. And unstoppable code is also the killer app for Ethereum, but between them there is this very subtle tension. And that tension doesn't appear until you start doing interesting things. You see, there used to be a time when Bitcoin hadn't offended too many people. We were still in the laughing at us stage the ridicule stage of development. And then something interesting happened, called the Silk Road. How many people have heard of the Silk Road? All of you. Very good. I won't ask. I'm sure it was just insulin and asthma inhalers. Good stuff you were buying. 
and you should. The Silk Road brought Bitcoin to the limelight prematurely, scared off a lot of Bitcoiners, and generated a ton of bad publicity that haunts Bitcoin to this day, because it associated the spending of money with the consumption of narcotics. <laughs> and of course, if you want to malign a technology, drugs is step one. Right? Child abuse is probably step two, terrorism is step three. You might rearrange them depending on the proclivities of your government. But if you want to wrap up a nice big dollop of censorship, you're going to pick one of those three wrappings to deliver it to the sheep and tell them why this thing needs to be stopped. You know, I'm no prude when it comes to consumption of narcotics and buying things in underground black markets. I understand. I like to think of these things as biology. Right? Did you know that dolphins get high? So you know puffer fish, right? And if you annoy them, they puff up. They also excrete a, a toxin on the surface of their skin that is, let's say, annoying at least, but potentially fatal to most fish, except dolphins. Dolphins get high off puffer poison. So what they do is they get in a circle, they find a puffer fish, and then they squeeze it in their mouth until it gets annoyed and release a bit of venom, and they puffer, puffer, pass. <laughs> puffer, puffer, pass. Because you know, they, they understand the etiquette of puffer chewing. <laughs> and, and so, like, if we were the first species to not get high, that would be an anomaly. Because evolutionary speaking, there is no species that doesn't get high. So when it comes to drug markets, I'm a pragmatist. Like, there's a reason people want to use drug markets, and the reason is really simple. You can't get stabbed over TCP/IP. <laughs> it's really simple. It's all about violence. And it has a very interesting effect on markets because it immediately removes violence, which removes a lot of the risk-based premium, driving prices out down and driving organized crime out of the market. Now, I'm not going to try and persuade other people that we should legalize this stuff. Colorado's doing a pretty good job at it. What I'm going to try and persuade people is that these things will exist. They will keep happening. They will happen because there's always been demand, there will always be supply, and where demand and supply exist, markets emerge always. And so what do we do about that? And what do we do about that as a community that's building platforms of code that are potentially unstoppable? Because right after the Silk Road happened, the conversation around Bitcoin changed rapidly. Until then, Quite a few large corporations were talking about it. And then they came up with this great phrase, which is, well, we're more interested in the technology behind Bitcoin, the blockchain. Right? Which is the sound of 10,000 marketing officers backpedaling furiously, because they just read the article about drug markets, and they're like, oh shit. Take it off all the posters. Well, I've got news for you. We're interested in the technology behind Ethereum, smart contracts. That is a phrase you're going to hear in the next few years. People are going to start backpedaling furiously. And the reason for that is because Ethereum is going to succeed. It's going to succeed in being a viable platform for writing unstoppable code. And the next Silk Road will be fueled by DAI, 
We'll be running on Swarm. We'll use Whisper communications. We'll be a fully autonomous DAP without administrators that you can give two life sentences plus 40. And it will be unstoppable. And the moment people figure this out, there are going to be calls to every prominent person in Ethereum, every committee, foundation, authority, governance body, anyone who seems to have any control, and they're going to say, "Yeah, that's that's cute, but stop it. Yeah, you've you've had your fun. Um, we heard you on stoppable code, yada yada, smart contracts, dabs. They said just stop it, okay? Because now it's a drug market. You got to stop it." And most of the people in Ethereum, if they're smart, are going to go, well, I can't, won't, can't, won't. What's the difference between can't and won't? What's the difference between can't and won't? Two life sentences plus 40 years is the difference between can't and won't. When you say you want governance, beware what you ask for. Governance changes can't into won't. And the moment you go over that line, what became what started as an ability becomes a responsibility. And if you claim you don't have the ability anymore, that responsibility just became negligence, criminal negligence, governance, an unstoppable code are going to form this very very fine line that we have to tread very carefully. Is your line the Silk Road? Probably not. I mean, look at where we are. Look at this crowd. Clearly not. <laughs> but what about child porn? What about terrorism financing? And and here's the problem. The problem is that we all have a moral compass, we all have a set of principles, we all have a set of ideals, and we like to believe that these are universal ideals, that these are universal principles, that we believe in one morality, one human set, a code of conduct. Where do you get yours? Maybe from a book, maybe from evolution, maybe from parenting, maybe from socialization. Maybe from Montessori. I don't know. But you got yours somehow. You have a moral code. Well, I've got bad news for you. It's not universal. It's highly subjective. It's incredibly relative. So let's talk about moral relativism. Moral relativism this is a fun topic, especially for conservatives. Any conservatives having an aneurysm in this house right now? Moral relativism? Now, I'm a moral relativist, not because I believe moral relativism is the moral choice. Ironically, it isn't. Moral relativism is the pragmatic recognition that I look around me in the world, and I read my history books, and I look at other cultures, other religions, other countries, other people with other capabilities and chances than I did. And they don't share my morality. In fact, I'm hard pressed to find any two people who share everything in their moral code. And this is where the crux of governance versus unstoppable code comes to a head. Because every conversation I hear about governance among affluent, privileged, Northern American, Western European people who share 90% of a common code of morality that is common only to 15% of the human population. I'm wondering, do you really think when you're saying governance has to be subservient to some kind of legal framework, when you're saying we need an anchor in law or a basis in law, whose law? Maybe you're assuming your law. I wouldn't assume that. Because every time someone says to you, that's illegal, don't go, oh yeah, probably. 
go where? Illegal where? If you understand one thing about the law, you understand that that question is the most important. Where? In Denver? In Colorado? In Wyoming or South Dakota? If you leave Colorado after having partaken, and you go to South Carolina, they can arrest you for possession for the trace amounts that are in your bloodstream. So they don't share Colorado's laws. And you don't have to go very far to cross that line and not know that you crossed that line or that the law suddenly changed very, very radically just in this country. But if you go a bit further, things get really, really weird. And we live in this bubble where we assume that our morality is, of course, the true one, the one true doctrine, the one true religion, the one true ethos, the one true culture. USA. But the truth is that we live in a varied world. And so when you talk about governance and you talk about applying law, the fundamental problem is where, whose law? And boy, will you hate some of those laws. My existence is illegal in at least four countries. Not my ideas, not my actions, my existence. I'm an atheist in at least four countries. Even if I say nothing, if someone can prove from something I've said in the past that that is my situation, label, non-religiosity. I mean, you know, it's a pretty narrow claim to make. It's not an earth-shattering description of what defines me, but I am worthy of the death penalty in four countries just for existing. Anyone who's LGBTQ, 83 countries where your existence is illegal. In North Korea, only six hairstyles are allowed for men. North Korea is the fifth country where my existence is illegal. <laughs> you may have noticed at this point that I managed to call this a hairstyle, as if I have a choice. Denial. The point being that the morality you apply is going to be highly relative. The laws you apply are going to be highly relative. If you set up a system of unstoppable code that is by default global from day one, that is completely borderless, you now have to contend with two possible scenarios. No laws or all laws. And the second one is impossible. You cannot comply with all laws. There will be contradictions that mean that in some jurisdiction what you are doing is illegal. So I'll just go for no laws. Fuck it. Unstoppable code. No permission. No apologies. No reservations. And think about this for a principle. For every bad application of unstoppable code that you can come up with, I can come up with a hundred good applications of unstoppable code that are abhorrent in countries that do not share my moral code. Self-sovereignty for women in Saudi Arabia. Abhorrent to their culture. A DAP that allows 13-year-old brides to escape the hellhole of their impending marriage in insert four or five countries here. Abhorrent in their culture. Moral in my view, but it's not my view that matters. The question is, if you create a framework for unstoppable code, what applications can we write as human beings? What applications will we write as human beings? I think we'll write some great applications. 
While we don't share morality, I think one of the common themes of humanity is goodness. We all share that. The vast majority of people given unstoppable code will write code that enables them to give their family a future, their children an education, health care, sanitation, housing, and opportunity. That's what people do with freedom. And guess what? Freedom itself is abhorrent in dozens of places in this world. An unstoppable code can fix that. If you have the ability to apply governance, to override, to overrule, to backtrack, to remove, to reverse, you will have the ability, and then you will be asked by every jurisdiction in which your code appears, which is every jurisdiction, at some point to exercise that ability. And maybe you'll say no, because they can't reach you from there. But they're going to reach you somehow, because you live in at least one country. Hey, you never know. We might fuck up an election and end up in a situation where our own government is asking us to do abhorrent things. What are you going to do then? Governance is a double-edged sword. Yes, with the dApps we have today, we need to have, in many cases, an oops clause. Right? Oops! I locked $150 million in my multisig. Oops! My decentralized autonomous mutual fund just went kaboom. Oops! Yeah, okay, we may need some forms of governance. Be careful when you put those in and think carefully about what capabilities you want to give to who. Because ability very quickly becomes responsibility, and then not acting becomes negligence. You will find yourselves unable to travel to a lot of countries if you start doing the wrong things with governance. If you do put an oops clause, make it an oops clause that blows up the entire DAP, preferably so that you can start a new one where you fix that problem and have less of an oops clause. Don't put oops clauses that allow you to reverse one transaction or narrowly tailor an intervention. There's a principle in law, at least in the United States, which is the idea of a common carrier. The concept of a common carrier is that, like a service provider or a platform, where the service provider or platform does not create or post content, and therefore they have a degree of immunity for the content posted or transmitted across their platform by users. Right? If I get on the phone and arrange a conspiracy to commit a crime, AT&T is not responsible for stopping me. They cannot be held liable. One of the concepts behind this is the idea that they cannot and will not tailor responses to specific content. If they start picking and choosing, if they start exercising discretion, if they start moderating, if they demonstrate the ability to remove some content and not other content, then the requests start pouring in. Right? I've been in some of these offices. I've seen it happen. You have a fax machine in the corner, and every few minutes it spits out a page, and on the top of the page is an eagle holding a hammer with a shield and a sword, and it says, Sheriff of Pissfuck Podunk Little Town compels you to do XYZ. If you open yourself to that, you are going to learn the names of some very exotic places, followed by the word cease and desist. So don't. Don't allow content-based restrictions. Don't build systems where you have moderating ability. Don't give yourself the power to stop unstoppable code. 
embrace the fact that what we're doing is important and it will require courage and before long we are going to hear some very non kumbaya sounds coming from the enterprise alliance the corporate partners the senior executives the board dudes the consultants and the, all of the mbas and at that point we need to remember why we're doing this why we're building this because there's no point in building stoppable code we already have it it's called the cloud it's an international surveillance engine where you put your data on other people's computers so they can rape your privacy every day and make billions We already have stoppable code, and if we were going to build stoppable code, for God's sakes, don't do it on an infrastructure that's so hard to scale, so bloody inefficient, so difficult to understand, that just to explain the most basic concepts takes 420 pages and two years of my life. <laughs> I have a suggestion. Microsoft SQL Server Enterprise Edition with Replication Engine. Got it? That's the platform for stoppable code. Databases. We have them. They work. They're efficient. We know how to use them. There's thousands of people trained on them. Hundreds of thousands. Millions of people trained on them. You don't need that platform. This platform is for unstoppable code. This platform is our promise to the future. We will do things differently because it matters. Thank you.